The only access time that I had to ball players was really during the um, time when they're supposed to be doing fielding and batting practice. Right. And that is not traditionally um, a time when they expect that they're going to necessarily be interviewed at any length by a reporter. And many of the male reporters, they wouldn't use that time in that way. They might be standing around the batting cage, they might ask a few things, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't going to be the time that they really went into anything with them. Sure. Um, because they could follow them into the locker room and have all that time. I needed, you know, needed the access. I wasn't mm -hmm. barging in on them and saying I demand it, but I was trying to indicate as the season would go on why it was important for me to have it. It wasn't just about me. I, you know, whether I got into a locker room or not is not going to change anything in our society. And so with the Yankees at least, which was the team I was around the most, right. um, about midway through the season in 77, um, the public relations guy, Mickey Morbido, would come to me and say, and he said, you know, we, we, I can get you access into Billy's office, Billy Martin's office, in the clubhouse, because the way the clubhouse was set up, there was the locker room and then there was another um, corridor off of the locker room that would go to his office. Mm -hmm. And I could get to that office by going in a side door of the clubhouse. And so um, Mickey would come around, he'd open the side door for me, and I would go in. And I would sit after the game, and at least I'd be able to sort of hear the back and forth. I'd often hear in those interviews what players had said in the locker room, because often the questions asked of Billy had to do what one of them might have said. So it was giving me a bit more of an access point to sure. understanding sort of the dynamics and what was going on. Um, so that was good. And then the last two games of that season, um, the Yankees gave me a pass to their locker room. Almost exclusively men, yeah. Ex oops. except for the women who were, you know, feeding them hot dogs or taking their coffee for Western Union. Um, mm -hmm. No, there were rarely, if ever, any mm -hmm. other women reporters in the press box. So when my generation came in, which is the women sort of in the early 70s, when we came in, um, expectations had changed. I mean, we had grown up in the wake of the beginning of the women's movement, and we had a clear message that, you know, there was a new playing field for us. And so it was sort of our obligation to, to, to do that, to, to expand the, the boundaries, you know, past what had been traditionally the women's role. From what I read subsequently, they didn't have much interest in seeing me arrive because I think they felt that with the arrival of one there would be others coming and they I think preferred that it remain the way it was. I think they liked the way it was. So so it wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a necessarily warm and I'm sure that I was a a piece of a curiosity item for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of how did you get here? What are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, are you really going to stay around long, or is this just a kind of you know, momentary thing that you're going through, and mm -hmm. maybe you'll be gone soon? So I think that there was a desire, a hope that I would be gone mm -hmm. soon um, on the part of many of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I wasn't going to. And there were players who sort of adapted to it very quickly, and mm -hmm. then there were ones who just, I think, didn't didn't particularly welcome, you know. My, it wasn't me, I think, right. as a target, but what I represented. And frankly, if you'd asked me back in the 70s when this lawsuit happened, would I think that there would be, um, you know, more equity in terms of women in sports, particularly in sports journalism? I would think there would be a lot more in there now than...